Welcome to Lane Parents. We are so um, appreciative that you have joined us for tonight's webinar. My name is Penny Wyatt and I'm the Director of Parent Programs here at Tulane. And we have a, a series of topics that we do, especially for the parents of new students. Um, during this summer time when they are um, between high school and starting the, um, at their university experience, we know that this is a time when there is a lot to cover, a lot to learn, and um, we wanna help your student have a smooth transition. And we know that um, providing information for parents is a way that we can help do that. And so this is our first webinar in our summer series that's on supporting your student through academic planning and course registration. So I'll tell you just a couple of the um, reasons why we have this webinar. So it's especially designed for those of you who are the parents of our new students. We'll provide some tips and tricks to help you support your student as they prepare for their fall 2022 course registration. We know that they will be doing that in the month of June. So that's why we're having this particular topic tonight. Um, we know that students need to take on this responsibility and they will learn how to do this. But we know that this very first time, um, they um, can use some extra support and it's helpful for you to know the structure of academics and our advising um, process and other support services at Tulane. And that way you can um, give them some guidance or you know, reassure them that we've got everything covered and that there's support here to help them. It's just good for you to know this for this particular semester and for the future, just to um, know how academic advising and course registration work at Tulane. Before we start, I would like to just mention a few practices that we use for our parent webinars. And so we um, do keep your microphones and chats um, turned off. This is a webinar um, format instead of a, a Zoom meeting. We also request that you hold your questions until the panelists finish the presentation of their content. Um, they have presented this many times. They have anticipated your questions. And um, every year we refine the presentation based on questions from the previous um, iteration of the webinar. And it helps us be a lot more efficient in how we can sort through the questions at the end and get to as many of those as possible. Um, I'll let you know that um, we always record the webinars and then post the a video link and the a copy of the PDF of the slides on the parent program's website so that you can access this information later and so that parents who couldn't join us in the live webinar can join us. So without further ado, I will um, turn things over to our presenters and then I'll rejoin you at the end when you can submit your questions. Thank you. Uh, good, e good evening, everyone. It's really wonderful to be here with you and thank you for all taking the time to attend this webinar on advising and registration for your first year students. My name is Sarah Montez. I'm the Executive Director and Assistant Dean of Advising Services for the Nickham Tulane College. And I'm joined by my esteemed colleague, Colette Raffel, and I'll let her introduce herself as well. Hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, my name is Colette Raffel, and I am the University Registrar and Associate Vice President for Enrollment Management. That's a mouthful, um, but mainly I'm here just to help your students uh, get registered and um, through their path at Tulane and, and all kinds of cool things like degree audits and tools that will help them uh, with their academic success at Tulane. So I will pass it on over back to Sarah. All right, thanks Colette. So tonight we're gonna have um, a few things on our agenda today. We're gonna talk about the advising model at Tulane, how advising will work this coming month during CAST um, and sort of a little bit more in the specifics around first year student registration and how that works for your students. Um, I'll take some time to talk to you about the core curriculum and major exploration for students. Um, we'll look at a, a typical first semester schedule and we'll talk specifically and give you some tips about how you can support your student, as well as some helpful resources and websites that will help 
you um, guide your student properly. So to kick this off, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our advising model here at Tulane. Um, if any of you visited uh, the university uh, in your um, discernment process of deciding on sending uh, your student to Tulane or your, Tulane, your, your Tulanean deciding on Tulane, you probably were um, showed a, a beautiful building called Mustafer Hall. Within Mustafer Hall is where our academic advisors, sorry, my dogs are greeting someone. Um, uh, our academic advisors um, work side by side with pre-professional advisors, so pre-health and pre-law advisors, along with our fellowship advising office, career coaches, um, success coaches, and study abroad. But all of our first year students, all of your students are assigned to an academic advisor from day one. They were assigned on the day of the decision day, May 1st. Um, and uh, they will always have an academic advisor within our office to help them with questions about major exploration, core curriculum, um, and questions about academic policies and procedures, things like leaves of absence and readmission. Um, our academic advisors are all professional advisors. And once a student decides on a major, which is typically in the second year, has to be done by the end of the second year, they will declare a major formally. And then they are at, they're adding a major advisor to the mix. So we like the, the little image here in this slide shows we add advisors we don't really take them away here at Tulane students will then start to work with their major advisor on major exploration and major planning course sequencing and also uh, opportunities within the major and their major advisor may be a professional staff member like my team is or it may be a faculty advisor um, in some schools they have faculty advising model so that's our advising model here at Tulane and I hope that helps um, explain our approach to advising um, and to further dive into this a little bit, I just want to explain that our philosophy around advising is that um, advising is a collaborative partnership. So we really do expect that both the advisor and the student are bringing something to that room and they're working to maximize your student's individual potential by sharing information, tools, resources, and helping your student an informed decision and really kind of self-actualize all along the way while their students here at Tulane. Uh, most of our students will meet with advisors about four times a year and they maintain close contact over email um, and with their advisor to help them with academic plans and registration and for information about academic and other campus resources. Um, so you can read more about us on, on our website and uh, that is advising in a nutshell. So what are we going to be doing this month? So your, your student should have gotten an email from admission with a scheduling link um, and your student will um, need to take that step, that action step, that first step of scheduling an advising meeting um, sometime this coming month within the month of June. Advisors have appointments all throughout the month. Um, and when they select that appointment, they need to make sure they're selecting an appointment that is going to work with their schedule. It's going to be tricky for us to readjust that schedule if they, uh, that meeting. Not impossible if something comes up, but ideally they're selecting that very carefully and they can attend that meeting. Um, the advisors will meet with the student one on one using a, the Zoom platform. Um, we're also familiar with Zoom. Um, and uh, that Zoom link will be in their uh, appointment um, confirmation email that they're getting from our appointment system. The meeting is designed to be a one on one meeting with the student and the advisor. So we ask you to refrain from joining your student in those appointments. Um, in addition to reminding students to sign up for this advising meeting in from admission in that admission email, there's also um, a request for all students to complete what's called the cast module, the advising and registration cast module. Within the module, there are a series of videos that were made by some fantastic students who will guide your student around um, sort of the nuts and bolts of the core curriculum, um, how the advising meeting will work and helping the student understand things like language uh, requirements and language placement, as well as um, reminding students to complete something we call a registration worksheet that is sort of our intake form for the advisor to read over before the advising appointment. We really need that those steps to be taken before the advising meeting in order for the advising meeting to be successful. And we would like to ask that all students complete that a minimum of one business day, but really ideally about three to five business days before the appointment. Not the end of the world if it's a one business day before. All right. 
I'm going to turn over Colette to talk a little bit about first year student actual the nuts and bolts of registration. Thanks, Sarah. So this this uh, cast event that we have in June, it stands for um, Cultivating Academic Success at Tulane. Um, many of your students um, have registered for the virtual uh, uh, cast sessions where they will um, learn about all the resources and and it, and wonderfully hear from students who have who are basically sharing some of their um, tips and tricks and things that they wish they would have known um, if they were a freshman uh, or first year student all over again. So it's a really wonderful program. As part of that, or in in combination with that, we also have the advising appointments and. Um, before that appointment, and actually uh, what I've been, myself and my staff have been doing for the past few days, we have been pre-registering your students, your incoming, the incoming freshman, fall freshman class, um, in a few courses based on their interest um, that they indicated. They received a survey from admission uh, soon after the they deposit or the deposit date of May one, checking in to see if their academic interests are still the same. Many of your students did, you know, indicate new interests, and based on those interests, um, we have pre-registered your student in a few courses. Um, it really depends on what their interests are, how many courses we register we pre-register them for, um, but uh, it's based on are historically um, what our incoming freshmen have registered for and what they need to set themselves up for an interest in a given area. Know that pre-registration is simply, um, you know, courses that are that are placed on their registration uh, in their in their in the system, but they can absolutely um, drop those courses. They can change those courses. We recommend, um, well, the the changing of those courses will occur at the point of the academic advising appointment because we want the student to speak with their advisor. Every student has some individual needs um, and questions, things like you know, questions about AP or an IB credit or may, perhaps dual enrollment credit. Um, if they're interested in a, a pre-health track, um, there are sometimes or questions regarding um, you know, the AP credit and whether they should uh, stay in there or, or take that course or just accept the AP credit. All of these questions are very unique and specific to each student. So that's really the purpose of these one-on-one -on -one advising appointments. During that appointment, the advisor will open up registration for that for your student and the student can make changes during that registration period. And that window of registration will remain open through midnight that evening. Um, course availability, how, we, how do we do this? We have perfected this uh, over the years so that we open up seats in all of the uh, 1,000, 2,000 level courses um, every day of, that we have advising appointments and we open them up based on the number of advising appointments for the day. Um, this has been very successful and, and the purpose of this is so that whether you register with your advisor on June 1st or on June 30th, you're still getting um, access to the same number of seats in a given course. Um, this, is, this works out pretty well. Uh, that with pre-registration has allowed us to really ensure that students uh, get in the courses that they need their first semester in order to set them up for success for the, the rest of their semesters at Tulane. Um, I can tell you about course availability that, um, you know, this is this is a difficult thing for for new students. Um, you know, in the past, in, in most high school situations, you know, you may have a choice of, you know, a, a couple of interests, right? Um, I can take, you know, maybe, uh, you know, a political science versus a, a statistics course, right? Here, I mean, we have thousands of courses. And so it can be a little daunting. And that's really the purpose of the, the academic advisor and all of these tools that we have, um, the registration worksheet. Um, the academic advisors help your student to answer, to call through all these questions. I can tell you that with course availability, if they 
if they can't get in the course that they want to get in their first semester or their second semester, we work with them um, to get the courses that they need when they need them. Um, this can be challenging. Um, and we just ask that you let your student advocate for themselves. This is a great learning opportunity um, and, and it really works. It teaches uh, the students some great skills in, in how to navigate all these choices and um, sometimes the order of operations, right? When, when, do I, when should I take this versus that? Um, there's, there's a lot to this, but it's, it's a lot of fun. I think it's fun. Um, so one thing that uh, you should know, all of, all of our first year students must take um, the first year seminar, which is called Tides. Um, that's the only course that they have to take their first semester. And um, for, so, so we will make sure that they're in a, in a register for a Tide in their first semester. Everything else is, is pretty much open. Um, there are a few caveats to that. Um, if you are uh, an honors student, you can register for a colloquia rather than a tide. Um, but, but every student does register for either a colloquia, most in a tide their first semester. Um, the credit min and max, um, we have a minimum of 12 hours uh, for, for your student and a max of 19. Now, in from this semester going, rather for, the, for this one semester, we're going to open it up to 19 their first time. It just makes it easier having that one-on-one -on -one appointment with the student and the advisor that they can register in up to 19 credits. Um, we don't advise that, that an incoming freshman register for 19 credits, right? Uh, the, the average is, you know, 15.5. So it's really 15 to 16 credits based on, again, on their interests um, is ideal for their first semester. 12 hours is the min. The minimum is um, 12 hours makes them a full-time student. So students in NT in Newcomb Tulane College need to be in 12 hours um, as a minimum. So we get through June. All of our incoming students have these appointments, these one-on-one -on -one appointments. We're very um, intentional about ensuring that each student has a quality experience and has the accessibility to all of the courses. And then on July 1st, we open up uh, all incoming freshmen's registration of windows so that they can um, add and drop. And there will be a lot of activity in July, uh, adding and dropping. Um, the one thing that we want, we also want to bring to your attention that will, as a parent, you'll find this very useful. Um, I did when uh, I still have a child in college is the academic calendar. So you'll want to make uh, this, or I, I just bookmarked the academic calendar so that you have that. It's on the registrar's website, registrar.tulane.edu. And you should encourage your student to become familiar with the academic calendar. It gives all the important information. When is the last day to uh, add and drop, last day to change a, a course type or, or grade mode, that kind of thing. Um, of course, all the, all the holidays are there as well. So that's really important as well for, for your planning and, and uh, getting, getting students home uh, back and forth. So academic calendar, very important. All right, Sarah. Okay, um, great. And thank you, Colette. And um, just a quick thing about the credit hours. I think I was gonna add um, that 12 credit hours is usually equivalent to about four classes um, or so. Most classes at Tulane carry three credit hours, which equates to how many contact hours the student's having in the classroom. Um, so most of our students will sit in about five classes, which we don't talk about this in terms of classes because a lot of it's variable, number one. And number two, a lot of classes have like co-requisites and things that are connected to them, like a lab or a recitation that might make it four credit hours versus three. So that's why we say 12 minimum, 16 is sort of the, the sweet spot and 19 is the max. Um, so that's just wanted to mention that. Um, I also wanted to just address the question that's in the chat really quick. Um, this, this webinar, much of this webinar is very pertin pertinent to spring scholars. Um, however, pre spring scholars are uh, registering not till in, for their classes for the spring of 2023, not until um, late October. And so, um, more to come uh, from us about uh, registration, advising and registration, uh, specifically for spring scholars down the line. But a lot of this uh, information is very pertinent. Um, 
core curriculum. Our core curriculum at Tulane, I think is wonderful. It's very, very flexible. Um, it allows our students to demonstrate both proficiency and also a distribution of knowledge um, in some really key areas. We have the proficiency requirements in, um, in math and writing and, um, and in language, foreign languages. And then we have distribution requirements across really a wide, wide range, everything from aesthetics and the creative arts to um, social and behavioral sciences and a whole bunch of stuff in between. The other aspect of our core curriculum that you probably have heard about is our service learning requirement. Um, Tulane is one of the only universities that has invested significantly and, and believes in service as a tenant of our education. So all of our students will complete two tiers of service, one in the first five semesters and the second and the final uh, time that they're here at Tulane. And that is service learning. So there's a service component attached to a course. Um, and so some of our students do engage with service learning right in their first semester, some even with the TIDES requirement. Um, and uh, so that's core curriculum. Our students um, can explore majors across our really six schools that uh, Newcomb Tooling College students have access to. Um, there are majors ranging from dance to um, chemical and um, engineering and everything in between. Um, and uh, your students uh, should take some time during their cast module at exploring the majors at Tulane and really having some time, some, some discernment around which majors are appealing to them um, and kind of making a short list of those majors so that they can have that conversation topic ready to, to engage with their advisor on. Um, the majors at Tulane, um, most of them are very flexible, but not all of them. There are some majors that are um, more lockstep or have a significant number of requirements that are really important to take in a certain order, such as business, engineering, and architecture are kind of our named uh, more restrictive curriculums. Um, and then there are others that have a lot more flexibility. Um, and so uh, when your student meets with your uh, the advisor, they'll talk about majors. Um, also, another thing to note is that what they're doing today, uh, today, tomorrow, or whatever it is for their cast appointment in the next month, it's uh, just sort of a first pass. We think of it, I think of it as a first draft. There's a lot of time to make changes. They may be very happy with their schedule and not make another change, but Tulane's um, approach is that um, we do give students time for you know, reflection and iteration. And so I really do value that a lot as um, having been uh, working and advising for about 14 years now, um, having giving students time to really percolate essentially on what they're doing and what classes they're taking and kind of their the downstream of um, effects of, of the decisions they're making in their cast advising appointment is really good because they can continue to tweak throughout the summer. Their advisor will do another outreach uh, later in the summer once there are any ad, uh, advanced placement or international baccalaureate credit comes in and do another schedule sort of check-in touch point with your student about that. So there's a lot of time and, um, and bandwidth for um, um, calibration. Um, and in the first week of the semester, technically it is the first two weeks, but I like to say the first week, really, students can make changes to the school, drop and add classes if they need to. Most classes really take off from day one. So adding a lot of new classes in the second week can be really intense and really hard for students. So I don't recommend making a lot of changes after the end of the first week. All right, Colette, you wanna tell us a little bit about this typical Yes, absolutely. So, so what you're looking at is um, a typical fall planner, um, and this might make you a bit nervous. I know it did. It did for me. Um, if you notice that the on Tuesday, this student has three courses back to back: uh, math, uh, econ, and I believe that is anthropology. And that little piece, sliver of white in between represents, uh, on a Tuesday, that represents 15 minutes in between classes. And that is plenty of time to get anywhere on campus. On Tuesdays, uh, I'm sorry, on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, um, we have 10 minutes in between, and that's, that's perfectly fine as well. Um, 
how a student determines how to lay out their schedule is really unique to the student. Um, there isn't any right answer, um, as I'm sure you can imagine, you know, uh, many of our students aren't crazy about taking an 8 a.m. class, but there are several that are, right? Um, and so it just depends on the kind of the type of student um, that you have. Um, and, and the spacing in between classes is also really unique. Some students really like to get, um, you know, all three, get, say it like this example, the Tuesday schedule, they'd like to have them back to back and then have the rest of the day free uh, for studying and clubs and things. So this is just an example to show you that, you know, um, they will be doing this work. Uh, they will be figuring it out and they will not be alone. An advisor will help them through this. All right. Um, let's okay. See. And um, yeah, and just to point out, this is a 17 credit semester. I'm sorry. Student. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank yep. you. And, yep. and the course, the course type, let me say something about what all these things mean, right? So MUSC, for example, the green box, MUSC 105001. That's what we call the course ID. So that's a music 105001, the dash uh, 01 and 02. That, those are the section numbers on the courses. Um, and whether you take an 01 or an 02 or an 03 of a course matters not, um, they still, all those courses would fulfill that requirement for the, of that given course. Anything else, Sarah, I should say about the schedule? No, that's, okay. that's good. That's great. Um, um, and we're going to have time for questions. I see some questions coming in. We do ask that you hold your questions till the end, but um, we will make sure we get to all of them. Um, so we're going to talk here about AP, um, which is Advanced Placement, International Baccalaureate, and Cambridge A-level credit, as well as pre-matriculation transfer credit. Well, that is a very big mouth mouthful. Um, so we have here two links on the spreadsheet, on the sorry, the PowerPoint here for you to, to resource and look at if you'd like. Um, the uh, AP guide, uh, advanced placement, et cetera, credit guide um, and their equivalencies is all listed on that first link. And um, you can see that, um, for instance, if your student is bringing in advanced placement credit for art history, they're going to get uh, added to their record three credit hours um, of Art History 1010, which is our early art history class. It's, um, we require scores of four or five for advanced placement. And all of those equivalencies are listed on this website. So one thing I think a big tip as a parent that you can do is to make sure that those credits are being sent to Tulane. Like the, you've requested the scores and they're gonna be sent um, this summer. I know many of your students are probably taking those exams either now or very soon. So many of the scores are sort of TBD. In the advising and registration appointment with your uh, the academic advisor, your student will um, talk about their sort of confidence level on, on tests that they haven't yet taken or tests that they just take took and they haven't gotten it. Uh, a score back. So know that that is sort of our approach. Um, and then once uh, the credit comes in over the summer, then we can have another conversation if there's needs to be tweaks uh, to the schedule based on the credit that's earned. Um, in addition, we are hearing more and more about students who are earning uh, credit through dual enrollment or even just taking college credit over the summer. That is becoming, I think, much more popular for students. Um, and we have a form that students can fill out to request transfer credit articulation for pre-matriculation credits. Um, side note on that, if your student is interested in taking summer courses here at Tulane uh, or at another institution um, this summer, they are not considered pre-matriculation students anymore. So they need to start working with their academic advisor on having transfer credit evaluation in a slightly different way because the rules are a little bit different, pre-matriculation versus matriculation. So just know that transfer credit is a little tricky and uh, especially as they become continuing students. And so just know that know that your advisor will know what to where to guide them and what, what the process is, but that's, that's the gist there transfer credit and AP credit. And how can you support your student? Colette, I think you were gonna take this one. Sure. 
So, you know, this is a, a big transition, right? So, so we want, we're telling you, we want your students to be advocates for themselves. We want them, they are to register themselves. They're going to have an appointment with their advisor by themselves. What can you do to support them? Well, you still play an important role. Um, we, we ask, and some, again, Sarah and I have been doing this for a long time, and we really have learned uh, some really good lessons over the years that um, to, that you can help your, you know, this is a time when you're not, you're no longer telling them what to do, but to reflect, to reflect on what they have enjoyed in high school, what are things that they're interested in, or even perhaps thinking about, um, you know, doing some research on, you know, what is a, uh, a study in say gender studies, right? To do a little bit of research or what is a uh, political economy, right? To, to really um, encourage your students to reflect on what they will enjoy and what they will excel in. And that may change over time and that's okay. Um, the other thing is to start having conversations about um, things beyond the first semester, right? So like um, one thing is study abroad. Is that something that your student is interested in. I hope so. We all, most of our students do study abroad, right, Sarah? We're still at a majority of, of study abroad. And, um, you know, That's there correct. are some things to think about. So, right. So if you're, especially if a student is interested in studying in another language. So, for example, if I want to study um, Italian in Italy in, gen, in my junior year, right? So, those are some things that you want to start thinking about because there may be language courses that you want to take, uh, you know, first semester, second semester, so that you will be, will be prepared for that experience. Um, so it's it's thinking ahead a little bit. Um, there's also things to think about with expenses um, with those kinds of things. Um, another another issue uh, summer school. So if a, your student decides or wants to um, take a summer school course. Uh, either pre-matriculation or later, you know, there are those, there are additional expenses there. So it's, it's a great time to think about the, the whole idea of planning, right? And how can we plan um, so that we can meet all of our goals and do some fun things and uh, basically provide, get the most out of our education. Um, and the, the last, this last bullet point is really hard. Uh, it's hard for me. Um, it's hard for my, my child. I know sometimes it's just to remind your student to be patient and flexible. Um, this is, there's no right or wrong here um, with so many choices and so many opportunities. This is the first time that many um, students, and that's one of the things I really like about CAST is they're gonna learn so much from current students of, about these kinds of life lessons. Of, of patience and flexibility and um, being kind to yourself and learning that it's okay maybe to, to you know, have a, make a mistake here and there and, and learn about resiliency, right? All of these things are, are really tough at this transition, um, but it's great to help your student manage expectations and, and to use the help. We have so many wonderful resources at Tulane from advisors, um, success coaches, career coaches, faculty, that to, to really demystify uh, asking for help, to, to de demystify um, the whole process of kind of failing, right? Um, and, and letting them know now that you're okay and comfortable with um, them seeking help, that that's perfectly normal. That's what school is about, right? That's what college is all about. And there's some wonderful resources at Tulane, uh, which they will they will keep telling you about. Um, all right, yeah, feeling stuck. That's a big one. We need to help them through that. So yep. additional Absolutely. resources. Yep. Sorry, Sarah. Um, no, go ahead. I so um, just some some good uh, things. That I would maybe bookmark some of these after you get this presentation. Uh, Registrar.tulane.edu/calendars. Uh, that's a really important one. Classschedule.tulane.edu uh, is where they actually register. It's a public site, so you can see what courses are available in a given term. Um, our catalog is very important. Another thing that you want to encourage your student to become familiar with 
catalog.tulane.edu. It basically is the rule book, right, for a given degree, a given major, uh, rules within a college, um, degree requirements. It's a wonderful resource um, for you and for your students. Uh, advising.tulane.edu has a wonderful resource, uh, so many things, but there's a, there's a freshman planning guide that they'll learn about um, a little bit later, right, in the semester or with, through CAST. Um, and that's a great resource for parents as well, um, just to help you find contact information and where to kind of pl help plug your student in. And the very important one, as the registrar, I'm going to say, there's a FERPA release. Um, so uh, if you're not uh, familiar with FERPA, um, you will become familiar with FERPA um, uh, through this summer. Basically, you no longer, um, once your student becomes a, a college student, uh, you, no, you no longer have access to or the right to their um, academic record without your student's permission. And so there's a form um, that, you that your student completes allowing the um, advisor to speak with specific people um, about the student's academic record. Um, good things to know about. Uh, how else, what else do we have, Sarah? I think the last slide is a thank you oh, with okay. our, with my uh, office's contact information and um, a link of a webinar um, feedback survey. Um, and I'm gonna invite Penny back. I know we've gotten some good, great questions. I'm excited to and anxious to answer all of them. Okay, so if you could just um, repeat the part about how seats in the typical first year courses are portioned out, uh, you know, over the month of June, I think some people miss that part. Absolutely. So um, what we do is the first step is we is pre registration. So we pre register the incoming freshman class in a couple of courses, one or two or three in some cases uh, for our more structured um, majors, but we, we pre-register them in a couple of courses. Then with what is left, we basically portion out those seats every day in the month of June where there will be advising appointments. And so say a class has five, no, let's say a class has uh, 30 seats available or left in a course, and there are 30 advising days, um, there will, one seat will be made available each day. So that, and I'm, I'm generalizing here, but the, the point is that whether I um, have my advising appointment on day one or day 30, everyone has the same access to courses. Um, and we've really perfected this over the years and it works very well. Um, and does that, does that, Sarah, am I missing anything there? No, I think that's great. Okay. I think that's great. Um, we have been doing yeah. it that way for years and years and years to, to, off, to offer more fairness to everybody in the process. Yeah. Yeah, and then, else, no, but I did want to clarify, I think there's some confusion about CAS, the three parts of CAS, and I know you oh. clarify in writing, Penny, but, um, just to clarify, there are three parts of CAST. All students will complete a CAST virtual group session or an in-person group session. That's one component. All students will also complete the CAST online module. And then any student who is not already registered and has not worked with an academic advisor this month will also complete an advising and registration appointment. The only thing that needs to be done advising and appointment is the module. Students do not have to complete the CAST group session before having their advising appointment. So I know that's a lot of pieces. Um, and so the advising appointment sign up is a separate component that students have to take that step to also um, register for that advising registration appointment. And Sarah, they get that link through admission, correct? They, yeah, they get that link. link. Yep. Okay, they've so, gotten it already and they're going to send another communication, I think, tomorrow. So, yes. And parents, I will say that one thing that you all could do to help us greatly is to remind your student to check their Tulane email. Right now, they're getting some messages through their Tulane email and their personal email, but 
we'll really wean them off of that personal email. For a lot of students, when they submitted their admission application with an email address, it might have been related to their high school. And so we really do need them to adopt the habit very firmly to check their Tulane email quite frequently. So um, that'll keep them on track with things too. Okay, so another question. Um, do students keep the same advisor for all four years? Okay, that's a great question. Typically, no. Typically, students will get a new advisor about once a year. We recalibrate advising assignments and caseloads based on both the advisor's focus area. So our advisors are specialized in, for instance, students majoring in the sciences, students majoring in the liberal arts. And so when a student's interests change, they'll usually have an advisor assignment change that next summer. Um, and then occasionally we have an advisor who moves on to a different role, either at Tulane or outside of Tulane. And so it's not very typical for a student to have the same advisor all four years. Typically the same advisor for one year is ideal. Okay, so another question is to um, clarify about TIDES, the core curriculum checklist says it has to be completed in their first year, but in this presentation we said should be completed in the first semester. So if you can just address that. So, sorry, yeah. So there used to be a required, in the business school, a tide. Oh, I'm sorry. And there's also the RLC tides, right? So, okay, sorry about that. Things change so quickly. I, I um, so, so for some students, uh, for the majority of students, the tide, their tide is taken their first semester and it's just one semester. For some, uh, and it's RL, it's the RLCs. I believe they follow into the second semester. I'm not sure about that anymore. I think it's okay. just one semester. I think it's okay. just the first semester requirement. Yeah. And RLC mm -hmm. stands for residential. I'm sorry, learning residential community. learning community. I'm terrible with the acronyms. Um, and and so really, Penny, it, it, it's it's changed a bit for business school students. It used to, but they've they've changed the curriculum a little bit. So it's uh, the tide is really for the majority of students the first semester. Um, that that is the that is the only thing that they have to take the first semester. And just so that parents know a little bit more about the tides courses, in addition to the fantastic academic content that they have and the the subject matter they're learning, we um, have a program where we have a an a, an upper class student either sophomore through senior peer mentor for the tides classes, and they also offer some ongoing transition assistance and keep the students surprised of other resources, you know, that are just general student resources, um, especially geared to students who are brand new. So that's another reason why that course with that additional assistance of the peer mentor should be taken in their very first semester. So here's another question. Um, if, if an incoming first year student took a gap year between high school and university, are there any different needs or requirements academically for them, um, you know, other than, you know, that, that are different from all the other first year students? No, but we would ask that your student just disclose the fact that they were a gap year student um, to the advisor. It can help contextualize further their sort of readiness to kind of hit the ground running. Um, we also just love hearing about what students do during the gap years. It's very interesting. It can uh, inform the advising conversation and that sort of connect touch point around where to, where to go, what direction to go with their schedule. Um, so, but generally speaking, there's not a, not a big difference, um, but uh, any student who's taken a gap year should definitely still complete the CAS, CAS module, complete the process of doing the registration worksheet, um, sending AP credit along, all of that, yep. So another question is about whether or not um, those, whether or not you really do open up new seats as the month goes on. And I think it's because people are looking at the, the class schedule um, and seeing that it looks like there are no open seats. So if you could explain that sort of sure. difference between what they might see online sure. and what the reality is. Right, so right now we've, we've locked down seats, right? Because uh, our, our continuing students have access to registration, right? So now typically, I mean, they're already registered. So typically they're not interested in these courses, but today is the day that we kind of lock everything down. We bring it down to its current enrollment. And then tomorrow morning, 
before June 1st, so we, we will parse out the seats before the first day of registration. So what you're seeing right now are not actual absolute maxes on courses. They are our preparation for this parsing of seats that we do. Um, but that's a great question. Yeah. Um, so for the honor students who have registered already, they want to discuss making changes or um, change majors. Will they be able to make an academic advising appointment after or during this past period of June? So I'm getting a message. My internet is unstable, so I apologize. But if you can hear me, uh, yes, after the month of June, after we're done with um, registration for CAST advising students, um, we'll have more uh, availability for continuing students and also the honor students who registered prior to CAST. Um, so this is a, um, there's a question, why do some advisors put a registration hold on the student's account while others advisors do not? Actually, all students should have a registration hold with the exception of our honor students at this point. Um, so the hold is intended to ensure that there is that equitable process of advising and seat, seat allocation all month long. So on the day of the advising appointment, the advisors will lift that hold, the students will be able to advise, be advised and register that day. And then they'll have a hold again that next, the subsequent day throughout the month of June to give an equitable and fair chance for everybody to get um, get a great schedule. And then it opens back up on July 1. And yep. I do always tell um, parents to remind their students to be patient when it reopens on July 1, because that does mean that they may have to wait for people to drop a class that they might be interested in them picking up. So it's So you have to look frequently perhaps and be patient and just watch for that. Could you explain about how um, the wait list for some courses works? Definitely. So um, during the CAST process, during the month of June, uh, we removed the wait list option on courses that offer a wait list. First, let me start with what is a wait list. A wait list is at Tulane um, for course registration, Basically, um, it's simply a list that students can add themselves to, um, and it it keeps keeps you in the the sequential order. Uh, if if I waitlisted before Sarah, I'd be number one. Sarah would be number two. The moment that a spot opens up, so another student drops, um, the person number one me, I will get an email at my Tulane email address telling me a spot has opened up for you in the waitlist. I have 48 hours to add myself to that class. Um, if I don't add myself to that class in the 48 hours, then that seat, the, then Sarah, the person number two, gets a notification and that seat goes to them. You may be wondering, why don't we automatically do this, right? If I've added myself to a wait list, why don't I just automatically be put in the class? Because we also offer that we allow students to add themselves to a class that may create a time conflict with that other one, right? So it's basically giving students as many options as possible. Um, this is a frequent question that we get all the time, like, why isn't this automatic? It's not automatic so that your student has, a cho has choices, right? But they do have that 48 hours to add themselves once they get another reason why Penny's um, uh, note about checking Tulane email frequently is so important is because those waitlist notifications will be sent to their Tulane email address only. Now, important thing to note, not every course has a waitlist uh, option. That is, that is up to the, to the department. And it's also impossible for co-requisite courses. So um, I would say the majority of courses offer a waitlist, but you won't see that waitlist during the cast, during the month of June, as we're parsing out seats. Uh, June, July 1, uh, by afternoon, those courses that um, do have a wait list, that option will be added to the wait list, to, to, the, to the course. Oh, Penny, you're muted. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, so another question is, um, for credit received with AP testing, do those count towards the core curriculum courses and categories, or do those credits just count towards the unit 
needed for graduation? In most cases, AP credit um, does not satisfy core curriculum. The two areas of the core curriculum that AP credit can be used is um, in um, language, foreign language, and in the formal reasoning, so math. Um, other than that, it can help towards a major. So for instance, psychology, a lot of students take psychology in high school, intro psych AP credit will get you into a, a pre-business psychology credit, take care of that, that checkbox or intro psych for the psych major or minor. So um, yes, and then if, if it's not being used there, it'll go into general elective credit just to give them credits towards degree. Yeah. Okay, we had a question about um, foreign language. Since we, you just mentioned that, let me ask this other question. How exactly does the language placement work if a student is continuing with a language? Do they just read the description and choose the appropriate level based on their experience? Or is there a placement exam? So it's, it's very dependent. So we recently kind of overhauled our language placement process to not be a one size fits all because we have all these different languages, everything from Arabic to American Sign Language to French to Spanish, Russian, Mandarin, Chinese. And so all of the languages have a, a slightly different approach. Um, so we would advise you and your student to look at the language placement website um, and that's uh, referenced in the cast module that your student will do before the advising appointment and that will guide them and, and send them to that website and then if your student let's say has a background in French that's the easiest one right now uh, French doesn't have a placement system anymore in that the students can self-place uh, which is great um, Spanish, which is our biggest language that our students take, um, typically do require students who have background in Spanish to complete a, a placement exam online. It takes about 45 minutes to complete that. And that's just to give a lot more precision to the process of getting students into the right level. So the answer is it depends. So, I know, sorry, real quick, I just want to yeah. say a lot of times the answer is it depends. And I can imagine as a as a parent that might be frustrating, but it really is, uh, it's because we have so many choices, right? And because uh, decisions are made, um, our language learning center is, is awesome. And they have really determined what works for language, some languages and what works for others. And the faculty are really involved in these decisions. So bear with us through the, it depends. <laughs> But the fact that they have so much help from people really does offset that it depends. Those people, the advisors, help you figure out what it depends on and, and guide them. So th there are a couple of questions that seem to show that there's some confusion about what happens July 1. And so there's some there who are thinking that students have to register again um, on July 1. And so could, if you could just clarify that. Sorry about sure. that. Yeah. No. So, so they, so what, it, what I mean when I say things open up again on July 1, all that I mean is that students on July 1 have the ability to drop an ad and make changes if they wish, if they want to make a change, if they want to make a tweak. Once they register with their advisor in June, or perhaps they've already registered if they came for an honors weekend, they're registered. They don't have to do anything else. If they're happy with their schedule, and I would say the grand majority are, right? They're, they're happy with their schedule. They don't have to make any more changes. July 1 is simply, you know, just to let you know that at that point, that hole, that registration hole will be lifted and they will be able to make changes on their own. Um, does that answer? Does that answer? So. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, there's a question about TIDES courses and does it count as a credit? So most yeah. TIDES courses have one credit, um, mm -hmm. but if they have a service learning component or something that's added to no, it. I think no, all of them, no. I think they're all one credit right now. And then the colloquium range between 1.5 and three credits. Okay. Yeah, I think all the and, service learnings are zero. And that's on. listed in the class schedule. It would show mm -hmm. the course, the number, the title, the, you know, but they're all credited. Week. It's a it's a and, it's a requirement in the core curriculum, and yeah. all types of courses carry and a credit. And they take those for a grade. They get yep. a regular kind of grade, so um, that's important to know. Um, should the the student try to select which tides course to register for, 
before their registration appointment or wait to see which are available with their other classes? This is an excellent question. I, think. I recommend that they make a short list of sort of their pref preferred options because it is an overwhelming amount of options. Um, but I, this is my thing about Tides. Tides is great. It's a wonderful requirement it's dessert. So they need to start working on their, they need to establish what their actual schedule is for their um, meat and potatoes component of their, uh, of their schedule. So, you know, the labs and the, and the, and the courses themselves that they'll be taking for, you know, core curriculum and for major exploration are really, really critical. And tides is, there's so many tides. And so, you can pick one that will fit in with the schedule. So it's really harder to build a schedule from tides up rather than the other way. Right, and I'll just add for a little bit more context because I used to manage the tides program. I can tell you that they are all designed to be smaller classes so that they facilitate more of that student to student interaction and student to instructor and faculty member interaction. And many of them are just a one-off offering. You know, there's just one section of a particular topic. So that also means that there are just fewer spaces in any you know, given TIDES course. So if a student tries to start, like you said, if they tried to build it from a TIDES class up, they're, they're limiting their options for everything else. So it really yeah. is good to have a, a good list, you know, short list of five to six topics. And there, that are, dealing. And there are basically three kinds of first year seminars, TIDES, the residential learning community tides and the colloquium. Uh, students will pick one option. They will take more than one of those things. Um, so let's see. I'll just add really quickly while yeah. you look, Penny, that that just remember that the purpose of the tie of the tides course, um, in, in my opinion, the value of it is it's a small course. It's it's 15 students to one faculty member, that faculty member is teaching a small course about something they love. It's yes. something they're passionate about. So the purpose mm -hmm. of the course is not so much, I hate to say this, but it's not so much the academic content, it's more about the relationship. So it, you know, focus more on whatever most, they're gonna have a great time, right? They're gonna have great time creating a, with that peer mentor and that faculty member, it's really about that small core cohort and forming that relationship with that faculty member. It, it models for them what it's like to be in a class that is more discussion-based. It models for them how to cultivate relationships with faculty members in a very different way than they would with their high school teachers. And so, yeah, it models a lot of things for them regardless of what topic it is. And so that's, that's a lot of the beauty of the way those courses are designed and planned. So, um, so one question is, um, students will register in June and they do that with their advisor. When they, if they need to drop an ad after July 1, do they have to have another appointment with an advisor? Can they do that on their own? They can do it on their own, but we'll, we'll be available off and on throughout the month of, of July and, and in August to help. Mm -hmm. And the so, CAS modules will teach them how to do that. So they'll, they'll learn yeah. how to do that within CAS. They'll learn the mechanics. So I think we need just another recap of whether or not the, model, the modules of CAS, the three components, have to go in a particular sequence. If you could just clarify that again. So, go ahead, Colette. OK, so, so no, they do not. They are not inter. Well, that's not true. They have to do the online module before, it is useful if they do the online module before their advising appointment. That, because it, there's an advising and registration preparation as part of their the, the online module uh, for the advising appointment. The CAST virtual live or in person is separate and a part of those two other items. I know it's confusing. We need to find and figure out a better way to explain these. <laughs> there, I'll, when I send a follow-up email to everyone, I'll give you a link. There's a graphic yes. on the CAST website. Yeah. I was just gonna it. pull it up. So if you, if you can find Can that. I pull that up? Can I just show that really quick? Yeah, and then you can share it, yeah. Yep. 
That Here would be we cool. are. Yes. Oh, awesome. Yeah. So I think that is much easier than the words that we're trying to explain to you. So the cast module, which is online uh, through their Gibson portal, they'll access that. It'll take about an hour, might be a little more if they're gonna do a, a placement exam. Um, and then any time in the month of June, they will do these two, two things, the advising registration appointment and as well as the cast session. And they are not in, can, the, when they do the advising and registration and when they do the cast session, matter they do not matter right they're not interwoven they're not interwoven yes um so we one question is what is ties and we have been using that acronym a lot too so it stands for Tulane interdisciplinary experiences seminar so they are they're very designed to be interdisciplinary um it's a seminar style meaning it's smaller and more discussion based than lecture based and they will often have some additional um, additional components added to them to just enrich that experience, like maybe a student faculty dinner or guest speakers from the New Orleans community or field trip experiences that are also a part of the class. I hope that helped explain that a bit. Um, and then let's see here. If a student is interested in the three plus three law program or another advanced degree program that's, you know, built on top of their undergraduate degree, is it advised to take 19 credits per, per semester? Um, for my, in my experience with the 3-3 law program, that is not required. The, the, fourth, the first year of law school, your, fourth, your student's fourth year, if that's what they choose to do, um, actually count as credits towards their undergraduate degree. So they do need to be careful about sequencing requirements because all requirements for the undergraduate degree have to be done in the first three, three years. Um, and the same goes with other accelerated programs that we have or any kind of rigorous program. I saw a reference to Altman and our uh, TAP TP Tulane Accelerated Physicians Program. Um, so they'll work with their advisor very closely or a program coordinator for that program to help with that. Here's another question related to foreign language. If a student wants to take a new language they haven't studied before, where do they start and how many semesters are required to meet the expectations in the core curr curriculum requirements? So our, our faculty indicated that the core curriculum, uh, that foreign language is very, very important to them and they want our students to demonstrate proficiency at the end of the third semester level. So at Tulane, a first semester level class is called 1010 in most instances, and that's the case for all the language classes. So 1010 and then 1020 and then 2030. So typically it's a three semester sequence, um, but a lot of our students will come in with um, placement at a higher level than 1010 and will um, satisfy it in fewer than three semesters, or they can satisfy it by proving proficiency either through AP credit or um, in some other way. And so that's, that's language in a nutshell. So here's a fantastic question. I think I'm going to give this parent an A plus for even asking this question. So um, they said that so far this information has been really helpful. There's a lot of good, great things that students should do and to a lesser degree that parents should do. From your experience, um, and from prior parent mistakes, what should they not do as parents to make this the most successful experience for their student? That I can't wait to answer that, may I? <laughs> <laughs> if I had to, number one, um, don't pick their courses for them. Let them select their own courses. And what goes along with that is don't tell them what they have to major in. They're not going to do well if they're not invested. Um, that, that's, there's a lot of other things, but that, that's my number one and my number two. Sarah, do you have yeah. anything different to add? Um, I would totally echo what Colette said. Um, and I would suggest as well that you um, stay engaged um, with your student. Um, talk to your student this summer about how the how, what kinds of ways that you will um, like, what are your sort of, what's your game plan, <laughs> essentially? Um, you want your student to be driving the bus and you can be a passenger. Um, and so think about your, your role as being kind of maybe the person that's holding the map in the background, but 
ultimately your your student is going to be able to pick whether or not they're going to turn right or left at that corner if they're going to take a take a stop at mcdonald's whatever so that is that is in my opinion a really a really good rule of thumb but stay engaged don't just assume that it's all good <laughs> uh talk to your student if they kind of start to close in and stop communicating with you then check in with them and find out what's going on because that can be an early indication that there things aren't going great so um and then know that in our in my opinion and from an advising perspective the best way that we can um have a great working relationship with you as a parent is if the student is always in the room uh, metaphorically or figuratively but really with us in the process and the dialogue so if you do feel the need to get connected with us we will connect and we really want your student to be in the conversation with us and and to not be left out of that conversation because that typically doesn't go very well thank you so much to the parent who asked and for um offering that response to you um and i'll just say one one other thing that i do try to remind parents of and this is further down the line. So right now I know your students thinking about what courses they will take, but then you're gonna be interested in how they're doing in those courses later. And um, one thing to know is that Tulane um, has midterm grades for students and that midterm, when midterms are due from faculty members to the university is always on the academic calendar. So if you also note that, you'll, you'll have, an, you know, you'll have um, information about when they're gonna get those grades. But a good thing to know about those grades is that they don't go on their final transcript. So it's an early indicator to the student of how they're doing. It's a good check-in and maybe a reality check for them. Um, and so if you wanted to kind of know when a good time to catch up with them about that is and have a conversation be before or after that, you know, send them some extra attention and support um, beforehand because they may have a lot of things going on right in you know within a week before midterms and then you know ask them you know if they feel good about how they you know their midterm grades turned out so that's just a good thing to remember for the future and it will always be on that academic calendar so here's a, a question that's more about how things are appearing in the modules so one parent said that their student said there's multiple modules and when she logs in is the one that's required title cast or something else? She, they don't feel like they've seen what we're describing. So, so I just put it. I just saw that. I just put that in the like. So, so when your student logs into Gibson and then and they they should be they should have, see the student tab, the student at the top, on the top left under services. There's a list of 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 things on the left kind of uh, border. Under services at the top, the first link is uh, NSO slash cast online modules. That's where they're, that's where they are clicking to do their cast online modules. And there are several modules. I think there's four modules. The one they want to do, the, in total, all four modules don't take more than an hour. You want to make sure that they do the advising and registration prep before their advising appointment. Um, I'm putting some of these links in the chat for everybody. Um, we'll usually include some of these things in the follow-up email that you will receive in a few days once we've edited the recording and um, have it posted and everything. So we're, it's after, it's well after seven. So I'm going to um, see if Sarah and Colette have a couple more minutes that we can go with a couple more questions. So um, let's see here. One question, do all classes have a duration of one semester? How many semesters are there in a year? So there's two semesters in the year from August to May, and then there's summer school programs that have varying lengths. Correct. And the students will register. So registration, that brings up maybe a relevant point. Registration for the second semester is quite different. If the students will, ideally meet with their advisor in advance um, and they will have a time ticket that is given to them through their Gibson portal that will indicate when their registration will open for the next semester and then they will register typically on their own um, using the 
learning and tools that they've had through their cast advising appointment and through ideally at least two advising appointments, one in early part of the semester and one closer to registration in October. So um, your student should have the tools by then to uh, really launch and be able to sort of register for classes on their own. Um, another, uh, so this, here's a question. Can you explain the recitation limitations and what they are? Are they required to attend those? Yep. Um, so mathematics courses, uh, typically are the main ones that will have a recitation component and they're run a little bit differently depending on the course. But um, yes, there are required attendance for those classes in almost nearly all cases that I can think of. And they're really useful. The recitations are typically a, kind of a breakout session and they're run um, as practice sessions for students. And then it's also where a lot of times exams and tests and quizzes happen. So absolutely essential for attendance, yes. Um, let's see here. Now, one thing that students, some courses have, and right now I'm blanking on the title for this, but they do have some optional um, programs that are led by a student who's already taken the class. So Sarah, yes, supplemental, supplemental mm -hmm. instruction you're thinking of. Yeah. Yes, a lot of our STEM and languages, I think languages, but STEM in particular, um, and economics have supplemental instruction run through the Academic Learning and Tutoring Center. Um, supplemental instruction is fantastic. It's a fantastic program. Um, and you uh, won't necessarily know which sections are going to have supplemental instruction. That's something that gets established over the summer. Um, but if your student um, is in a section with this instruction, uh, SI is what the, what the student leader is called. That student will have proven to be a very successful student in that class in a previous semester, been nominated by their faculty member, I believe, um, serve as a supplemental instruction um, sort of TA for the class. And then we'll run sessions as well as like manage a wildly helpful group chat for their students in the in the class. Um, and uh, I have a student at Tulane. And so I have seen this firsthand. It's it's pretty impressive. So um, yeah, SI is great. And usually the, um, the professor would note in the syllabus if there is an SI um, component that's available. So again, it's not mandatory. It's not required. It's supplemental, um, but it's very, very valuable. You may hear your student talk about that down the road. Yeah. Um, I think that we'll probably have to close now. If, um, if your student still has questions or you've got questions that are still you know, lingering, I would say go to that website and look over the CAST overview and look through the components again. Have your student check their email so that they've definitely caught up on everything that's been explained to them so far um, and just re review that carefully. And um, then if you still have questions, then what would be the best way for them to reach out with those questions, Sarah? Um, they can email advising at Tulane.edu. Super easy. I'll put it in the chat. Or I guess Penny will put it in the chat. Yeah. yeah. Um, so here's one last question that came up. Um, an advisor told the student that their I, who is I guess waiting for their IB um, program information, um, that they can't pick their classes until mid July when IB credits or information will come in. Can you speak to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... I, I would have to know this very specific instance of that. That person is welcome to email me. Um, Penny, you want to put the email yeah. in, my, in the chat for me? Um, I would have to understand what the context is. Generally speaking, we recommend that students complete as much as possible their full schedule on their advising registration day. Yeah, and, and it's very common. AP and IB comes in in July. Um, and so, like Sarah said, tweaks are made, but typically a student registers in June and then once those grades come in, then tweaks might need to be made. But, but more times than not, the student, their, their gut of how they did, you know, uh, the confidence level of how they did on that test 
it pair it 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 um it fares pretty well with how with reality and so we help the advisors in the registrar's office we override prerequisites and things or put them assuming they're going to get ap credit or iv credit so that they can go ahead and register and that works very well so okay there's two last things i just want to get in because i think they'll probably help a lot of people where do they send the ap scores to whom or to what email address it's okay. on the college board. Um, there, there's an uh, they they have to select the university, and it's electronically sent. Um, so there there really aren't any like mail options. It's electronically sent to Tulane University. And then there's um, a question that's come up a couple of times: Is there a form like FERPA, but is for medical information? And so that is a completely separate form because it's um, our campus health center has to operate under HIPAA um, guidelines. And so um, there is a form on the Campus Health website and they have a tab on that website that says, especially for parents and guardians. And so you can find some of that information and we'll discuss that in future parent e-newsletters as well. So um, just keep an eye out for that, but it is different. And, um, the, and so the, the FERPA form has to note which of those other sources of educational records the student is giving access to, because they could give access, they could give parents access to talk with administrators about their grades, but maybe not their conduct um, um, record or, you know, this, that, and the other. So, but because, the, because of HIPAA, there's a completely um, different one. So um, let's see here. I'll add a couple more things in the chat so you can look at this. And, um, and then I just want to let parents know that we'll have more webinars as the summer goes on. Um, several of them will be this month. Um, and those will be mentioned in the parent e-newsletter. So if you didn't see the parent e-newsletter that came out on the 16th of May, check your spam folder because sometimes they land there. Um, and if you um, still can't find it, then you can email me at parents at Tulane.edu and give me your name and email address and I'll um, check to see what's happened there and add you to that. We'll have another one going out tomorrow or the next day for the beginning of June. So we will give you this guidance as the summer goes on so that you can support your student um, in a really helpful, helpful way that still recognizes that this is a maturation process for them and they have a lot to learn, but it'll help familiarize you with the way that Tulane does things. And I know that sometimes we have parents who have older students who've already gone through this at another university, but they still find it helpful to learn about, you know, the resources at Tulane and procedures at Tulane. So um, we will also send you in that um, follow-up email a link to give us feedback about the webinar. So we would appreciate your doing that. If you have a comment you want to type in before we close, you can do that now. So, um, but we really value the, the feedback from parents and we're constantly improving things and, and refining things from year to year. So we, the things that you might appreciate um, about this may be suggestions that parents made, you know, four years ago or more. So um, we really value this partnership and we appreciate all of you who joined us tonight. So thank you so much. I'm going to... Um, Close everything out now. So have a good evening. Good night. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.